Welcome to the Titans of Industry show at WealthResearchGroup.com. Today, I have the legendary Bob Moriarty on who founded and operates one of the original gold sites, 321gold.com, a great resource for professional investors. Bob, you know you need no introduction. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing very good. Neither you nor I are as in Florida or Texas so we're doing well. Well, um, like I told you off off uh, off the air, I was both in Texas and in Florida just now. So I, I escaped both um, in a matter of days with um, without knowing that uh, these things will happen. Obviously, look, when you were here uh, with us, we we discussed how bad things are with the young citizens of Europe and how impoverished. They are, and just about the huge unemployment rates with, uh, with people 20 to 30 in Europe. But in the U.S., it's estimated now that 33% of the poor have some sort of a connection with millennials. What social and economic effects does this data result in? Well, uh, we're, we're coming very close to a civil war. Uh, the interesting thing, and I don't want to defend Trump, however, I will attack the 95% of the news media articles about Trump that are negative. And certainly there's a lot of things about Trump that are negative, but there's a lot of things that are being misrepresented. Uh, the, the riots in, in Virginia here a couple of weeks ago when he came out said uh, both sides are guilty. He was absolutely correct. Uh, you you had the anti uh, uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but anti FA in theory, the anti fascists. I mean, they were absolutely fascists, and they were attacking people. And the media doesn't say anything about them, but the media talks about the uh, right wing. Uh, white supremacists. Now, I'm not in favor of white supremacists, but I'm also not in favor of Nazis attacking people who are, who are protesting legitimately. The, the news media is creating a monster, and there are people like George Soros who literally are going out and they're paying people 25 bucks an hour to riot. Uh, I, I don't know how the Trump presidency is going to end I know that it will end, and it will end badly. But some of the numbers about young people today are truly scary. 70% of young people in the United States do not qualify for the military because of either criminal records, drug use, uh, or they're overweight and out of, out of shape. Now, that's a really scary number. I'm not in favor of a draft. I'm not in favor of a large military. But should you need a military, uh, you can't have a bunch of drug addicts with criminal records who, who are overweight. Uh, I, I, I take all of this back to a lack of a gold standard. If you go back 500 years, if a king went out and waged wars against his so-called enemies and he ran out of money, he could look into his vault and not see any gold and silver and realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm broke. I've got to stop doing what I'm doing. When they tied the U.S. dollar to gold in, in 1944 and literally made the dollar as good as gold and then tied all the currencies uh, to the dollar so they were indirectly connected to gold, uh, as long as that, that tie existed, you had some control over government spending. As soon as the tie was broken, on August 15th of 1971, you, you came into an era where every government on earth realized that if they needed money, all they had to do was print it. They have created a monster that's going to blow up one day, probably soon, and things are totally spiraling out of control. We, we no longer have an economy where supply and demand means anything. We, we have a government spending money that they don't have and never will have. And we have uh, hundreds, well, not hundreds of millions. We've got 100 million Americans who believe the government checks are always going to keep flowing. And I can assure people 
there's going to come a time that's not going to be true. Well, Bob, you, you could say that in another way, you could say that the currency used to be commodities, so people would trade uh, commodities as currency, and then in 1971, for the first time in since the days uh, when Kublai Khan tried to try to create uh, paper money that has no tangible, um, you know, backing to it, money be or currency, I should say, became political. So what we have right now is political currencies, and you know, the United States, which has the the largest economy, is has the the most uh, sought after currency, but currency is politics today. And with cryptocurrencies, what we're seeing is currency is mathematics. So we'll see. This is the, it looks like the third wave of currency is upon us with this and this experiment with uh, money being political. It's it sounds bad from day one, in my opinion. Um, on on the ongoing situation with North Korea, is this the only catalyst behind the enormous move for gold here? Gold is surged above 1300, then boom, surged to 1320, surged over 1340, and even touched a new, um, you know, 52 week high at above, and all above the 2016 high of, of 1352. What is going on? Is this all related to political, or are there any other catalysts in your opinion? Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't ascribe the movement of commodities to news. We've been taught, you know, when I was a kid, you'd turn on the six o'clock news, and if they were gonna talk about gold, they'd say, well, gold went up a dollar today because the Dow went down. But it really didn't make any difference what the Dow did. They were gonna try to connect the two, and, and I've never found that they really are connected. There's a lot of reasons for gold to go up. And, and North Korea is really fairly meaningless. I, I don't think fundamentals have that much to do with the price of gold or any other commodity for that matter. Uh, when, when gold hit an all time high in September of, of 2011, the fundamentals were all positive. When gold hit a, a, a near all time low in relative terms, back in August of 1999, the fundamentals were dreadful. So there really is no connection between fundamentals and any, any short-term news movement is in fact short-term. Now, we had a bottom in all commodities. We had a 5,000 year low in January and February of 2015, 2015, no, 2016, and I, I think that gold started a bull market there. I think that all commodities started a bull market there. Uh, we've had a nice rise. It's seasonal. It happens every year. I think there'll be a short-term correction, and then I think it will continue to go higher. Now, one of these days, gold, silver, and all commodities are going to explode higher. When, when the public actually realizes that they're playing high-stakes poker, with monopoly money, there is going to be a rush into tangible uh, financial assets that you can actually touch. The, the financial system has been totally distorted. I feel sorry for, for young people today. They're getting out of college with, with tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And, and they have uh, an education that's essentially worthless. All of this has to do with government printing money. Now, one of the best things about state governments is that by and large, the, the Constitution to so most states require the states to maintain a balanced budget. The United States government, the federal government, should maintain a balanced budget, and nobody wants to do that for political reasons. As long as you're spending money, you can buy votes, and, and Congress finds that very attractive. Uh, one of these days, the system is going to break, and we're going to pay for it in a big way. Now, Bob, I was one of the original Bitcoin speculators at thirteen dollars. I sold most of it up to four hundred dollars. Then I returned a little bit below a thousand dollars once more. With Wealth Research Group, we suggested Ethereum at twelve dollars eighty cents back in February. I'm sorry, March, 
and it's it's now about 300 it was uh, at the high 392 and that's in five months that's a almost a 30 time return but these were both speculations that we suggested people you know check out and and, and act on consider acting on with small amounts after attending some blockchain summits I am no longer speculating I've turned into a value investor and I can see now how Bitcoin is only the tip of the iceberg blockchain is the real innovation and cryptos are a part of it but this can really revolutionize you know even the transparency of the gold market and the and end the manipulation because if you put everything on that public ledger if you put everything on the, on the blockchain it becomes uncorruptible you can see the leverage in the system and all of these banks will have to dissolve these you know uncredit worthy and uncredible uh, ETFs that they run banks are also scared Bob because we're headed into the third wave of the internet after wave one was websites wave two was social media this is the, the third wave there and, and they become obsolete it looks like banks are being Amazoned in the financial <laughs> services department. Uh, do you agree with how you know revolutionary and unique this could be? Well, I I do, but let me let me disagree with you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to agree with the way you handle it. First of all, Bitcoin, and when I say Bitcoin, I include all 599 other variations of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is uniquely different from blockchain. Blockchain allows financial record keeping of everything. Okay, we we can trade gold with blockchain, silver with blockchain, uh, stocks with blockchains. Now, let me give you some interesting figures. The theory behind Bitcoin was that one, it's rare. Uh, two, there's a limit to how much Bitcoin there could be. And three, it, it's autonomous. It's independent of government agencies. And China has just proved they could shut Bitcoin down uh, in a day. And there are 599 other Bitcoins out there. So it's certainly not rare. Uh, Bitcoin, in my view, is a tulip bulb. It's a beanie baby. It's something that, yes, you can speculate in and make money, and you have, and people who listen to you have. However, uh, it's going to blow up. There is no way governments are going to allow uh, individuals to have uh, autonomous, uh, independent uh transactions. They're just not going to do it. And they could shut it down. I mean, all you have to do is target uh, digital records that are the length of the blockchain, and you could shut it down overnight. That's what happened in China. That's absolutely what's going to happen in the United States. If, if people think I can use Bitcoin and the government can never figure out it's not me, uh, it's absolutely not true. The governments know everything about that, and they can track it, and they can track it back to every single trade. So it's not something that's anonymous. However, blockchain is enormously valuable, and it's going to make tremendous changes in our life. And I don't know a good way to describe it. I would say it's a way of accounting for transfers. And, and, and it's very important for that reason. But I totally discount all Bitcoins. I've never speculated in it. I wouldn't touch it at any price uh, because it is a tulip bulb. It has every single aspect of tulip bulbs and beanie babies, and it will blow up. Well, that's, that's uh, kind of what, what I uh, uh, originally uh, intended the question to be so I, as I, I just want to clarify Bob <clears throat> the blockchain is what made me a value investor the blockchain is where the potential is Bitcoin is like I said it's the tip of the iceberg for a, a total revolution um, yeah. Bob I want to I want to talk about some data which is very contrarian and very provocative and I'm gonna let you answer this and then I'll also share with you my take on this pension funds 
have a record amount of cash on hand. Warren Buffett, just for example, has $100 billion in cash as opposed to a normalized $20 billion that he keeps uh, for Berkshire Hathaway. It looks like there's so much institutional cash on the sidelines. Could this bubble go on for much longer? Could we just be starting and could we see you know the the Dow Jones hitting 50,000 points the 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 S&P 500 doubles from here is this um, could, could this go on for two three years longer because you know what if you look at the alternatives at the bond market you cannot say that stocks are um, expensive because if you think of the alternative to loaning money to a government or an institution that cannot pay you back or that you're guaranteed to lose money. Stocks, even expensive ones, if they're good businesses, they're a better long-term investment and I can see why companies or institutions or funds that have billions of dollars and they have to put it somewhere will go into expensive stocks before they go into bonds. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but also tell me what do you think could this bubble be, you know, just starting? Could we see another year of this? Well, it, it, you you used a real interesting term because you've described it as a bubble, and of course it's a bubble. Uh, let me give you an example of what I think is going to happen. I started investing when I came back from Vietnam in the spring of 1970. And I read something in the Wall Street Journal, which was the Internet of the time, that said there were more mutual funds than there were stocks. And if you think about that for just a minute, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, how can you have more mutual funds than you have stocks? And you can't from a lot of so let me show you some other numbers. How can you have the lowest interest rates in 5,000 years? How can people loan money to anybody at a negative interest rate? I mean, I give you $50, and then in five years, you give me $49 back. Now, justify that based on logic, and the answer is you can't. Now, it is factual that there are more ETFs today and there are stocks. We're in exactly the same position we were in in the spring of 1970. There are more ETFs than there are stocks. Now, ETFs are derivatives. The danger with derivatives is not the stock market. The danger with derivatives is counterparty risk. Let me give an example. Let's say uh, Irma hit Miami and did $200 billion in damage. And you had a house in Coconut Grove, and it was fully insured for a million and a half dollars. You go to your insurance company and say, okay, my house got death, knocked down. I was insured for a million and a half dollars. How much money do they give you? Tell me. Nothing. If Miami was hit with a Category 5, hurricane and $200 billion worth of damage was done, every insurance company in the state of Florida would be bankrupted. So it's no longer a hurricane risk, it is now a counterparty risk. If you go back to 2008, Goldman Sachs uh, should have gone bankrupt, okay, because they were functionally bankrupt. AIG was bankrupt, but we didn't let them go bankrupt. Uh, we are creating so many distortions in the system that one of these days the system is going to break. It's going to break because it has to. The, in, in 1998 or 1999, the t then head of the CFTC, uh, a woman named uh, Beardsley Bourne, she said, look, derivatives are totally out of control. or are $70 trillion dollars. And the counterparty risk is terrible, and, and we need to control it. We need to bring them under control. And the powers that be uh, in, in Wall Street uh, ganged up on her, 
booted her out of the CFTC and, and would not control derivatives. Uh, derivatives got up to about $700 trillion in 2008, and then they backed off to about $550 trillion, and they're back up to about $600 trillion, as I, I believe, right now. There is $100,000 in derivatives for every man, woman, and child on Earth. When the system breaks, every ETF is going to revert to its true value, which is zero. And you can be the smartest guy in the universe. You could have gone out in 2008, looked at AIG, and said, AIG is functionally bankrupt. I'm going to buy a uh, million dollars in puts on AIG. And you would have lost your shirt, okay, if AIG had gone bankrupt, because the risk would not have been AIG and whether they were functionally bankrupt. The risk would be counterparty. There is always, always, always counterparty risk. So could the Dow and the S&P keep going up? They could, but we've had one of the longest uh, bull markets in history. It's totally out of control. Everybody's on board. And the fact that, that – uh, People have $100 billion in cash. Let's go back to 1928 and 1929. Now, the powers that be, the Bernard Baruch's and the Joseph Kennedy's, knew a crash was coming, and they were in cash. The difference between 1929 and today is the average guy in the street had no access to information whatsoever in 1929, Joseph Kennedy certainly did, Bernard Baruch certainly did, but the average guy did not have access to that information. But the average guy does have access to that information now. Now, we've been running our website for 16 years, and we've given very good advice for 16 years. And I'm not going to say the, the Internet is the font of all truth, because it clearly is not. However, the average guy can go out and he can do some research and he can read some very uh, interesting, accurate information and he can watch some good stuff like your site. Um, and he does have an advantage now. So, so things have totally changed. And I think a lot of people recognize the system is, is extremely uh, dangerous. It's totally out of control and it will revert to the mean. I don't want to get caught long when you should be outside the market. I, I see Bitcoin and people write me and say, well, I bought Bitcoin at 1000 and it's 5000 now, and see, I made all this money. You don't make any money until you sell. You can buy something cheap, but if you don't sell it when it's dear, you don't make any money. The stock market, I believe, I think, I'm not a guru. There are no gurus. I think that the stock market is very extended, and I think one day, and, and potentially one day soon, it's going to break. Well, I, I can, uh, like I told you, I want to share with you uh, some provocative opinions that I have, and you know, then we'll, we'll move on to the next question. But um, Wealth Research Group, we just released a special report called uh, wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash crash, and it's my own blueprint on how to anticipate, prepare, execute, and uh, invest in the aftermath of a crash. And one thing that I point out there is that in two, from 2000 until 2008, stocks were dead money. So uh, long-term investors, buy and hold investors, they made no money. 2008 came and you know they got disgusted with stocks and this penny came, they sold hard. They sold hard and they had no profits, so they couldn't reinvest what they sold. What they sold was owed on margin. So you saw all sectors going down at once. All sectors, no matter the fundamentals. It was a credit crunch. And you saw the precious metal sector go down in, in a panic mode, in, in a crisis mode. And people, uh, investors, believe this is what's going to happen today as well. And you got to remember, in 2008, we came off a super cycle of commodities uh, bull market. So people had a lot of profits 
in the um, in the commodity sector. And when they sold, they took profits and they let it go down to you know ridiculously low levels in 2009 when they piled back in. Today, the opposite is true. We're after eight years of a bull market. Some institutions, some people, individuals, but mostly you know smart money that came in in 2009 with lo lots of cash is sitting on a lot of profits. And when they sell, this time, they're gonna take profits and reinvest where it's cheap. I don't see precious metals, which have not performed well. The stocks have gone sideways or down for, uh, for one year, and before that, they went straight down for five years. So the people who own precious metal companies, precious metal stocks, and commodity stocks are not sitting on large gains, if at all. And therefore, they do not want to sell in a panic. They will hold. They don't have any uh, reason to liquidate when, when they know that they can just weather this out. And on the flip side, you got all this money that could come in. So I see this time, when the crash comes, I see people taking profits, and I, I'm, we're talking billions and billions and tri even trillions of dollars of profits from the large S&P 500 NASDAQ companies and they will look at what's cheap and the only sector that is truly, truly, truly cheap is commodities and I don't see it selling off. I see it re people reinvesting there in the paradigm shifting into commodities. That's at least my take on how the crash will, will happen. I know a lot of people are waiting on the sideline, precious metals investors, and I, th I think they're making a grave mistake because they will have to bid, they will have to do a war bid with very, very heavy uh, pockets of institutional investors, and I, I think both of them will not be able to find uh, screaming deals. Bob, um, I want to move on, though, um, and ask you this. You, you know, you lived a, a great life. You've been around the world. You've seen many financial opportunities and crashes. How big do you think is the potential with commodities today? Oh, uh, that's really funny. Okay, uh, if you go back to January, February of 2016, commodities were at a 5,000-year low. If you're in anything that is a 5,000-year low, mathematically, it has to go up. Okay, uh, in, in my... I, I, that wasn't funny for a lot of people. <laughs> No, no, it wasn't funny at all. However, it's something that there's a lot of things that happen that you don't need to explain. You don't even need to think about interest rates the same. If you got the lowest interest rates in 5,000 years, where are they going to go? Come on. That's a question a two-year-old can answer. You don't have to know anything. If it's at a 5,000-year low, anything, it has to go up. Uh, there is going to be the greatest transfer of wealth in history because there is hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of paper assets that are going to evaporate. They're going to disappear. They're going to go to their real value, which is absolutely nothing. And, and people are going to be looking for real assets. And the really funny thing, it's going to be true of corn, it's going to be true of wheat, it's going to be true of zinc, it's going to be true of gold, it's going to be true of silver. Uh, I'll give you another thing, and I, I cover this in my book, Nobody Knows Anything. You want to buy things when they're cheap, and you want to sell things when they're expensive. Right now, gold is expensive in terms of silver. It's also very expensive in terms of platinum. You don't have to know anything about where gold and silver are going to go. All you have to know is gold's expensive right now, silver's cheap right now. If you got into a gold-silver spread, sold gold, and you bought silver, mathematically, you're going to make money 99% of the time. Those are the kinds of investments people should do. And instead, they try to overthink things. There are 10,000 guys out there running websites, telling people what they want to hear, and feeding them nonsense. Buy cheap, sell dear. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Bob, uh, what's the most what's important the lesson thing? you've learned specifically in natural resource investments? I, I, I think that's it. I, I think buy cheap, sell dear. 
Um, there are investments that you, that you can make where you do not have to predict the direction of, of the commodity. You just, per, uh, if something is totally out of whack and commodities were out of whack in 2016, interest rates are absolutely out of whack right now. I believe the stock market's out of whack right now. If you sold the stock market now and bought commodities of any sort, I, I think that would be a very good bet. Now, now, let me expand a little bit on your gold shares thing. Gold shares actually peaked in comparison to gold in 2003. So in nominal terms, they appeared to go up from 2003 until 2008. But in actual terms, compared to gold, they didn't. Sure, they underperformed. Yeah, they underperformed. So, you know, gold is not a religion, okay? It's not something that you go to church and you pray to the gold god. Gold is an investment. And right now, it's probably a very good investment. But right now, silver and platinum are better than gold. Uh, there will come a time when the stock market's cheap and it should be bought. But I, I don't see that happening any time in the next 10 years. But commodities overall are very cheap now. Well, obviously, buy cheap, sell dear. The, the part about buying dear is called the margin of error so, or the margin of safety, uh, of safety. When you buy cheap, the downside risk is much lower than the upside potential. And that's obviously where everything should, uh, should uh, fo all your energy should be focused, especially in a cyclical environment like natural resources. Lastly, Bob, do you see China right now looking to dethrone the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency? I mean, they're, they're, they've created this oil futures market, which is going to be convertible to gold. They're officially getting into the SDR. Um, are they setting up what, they're, what should be called a financial war? Well, uh, that, that's, that's a bad way of putting it, I think. Let's say, let's put it a different way. Did China just go to a gold standard? Yes. Interesting. So, in your opinion, they're doing an unofficial uh, gold standard by... No, no. No, they're doing an official gold standard. They've tied oil to the yawn, and they've tied uh, oil to gold, which ties yawn to gold, which is the gold standard. But, but you know, that's really simple. Uh, China and India were the leading economies in the world for 18 of the last 19th centuries. So is China trying to overthrow the United States? No, absolutely not. I mean, for 18 of the last 19th centuries, China and India were the economic powers in the world. And they're going to be the economic power in the world again. But certainly both Russia and China appear to understand the U.S. dollar uh, is toast over the long term, and they're going to go to a gold standard. Bob, thank you very much uh, for being on the show, spending time with us. Again, the website and what people can find there? Uh, 321gold.com and 321energy.com. Perfect. Hey, thank you very much, and we'll definitely have you on again with, with another update. Good deal. It's always good to talk to you. Ask great questions. Thank you very much.